Do we need Alex here? Or no? Do we need, do we need Alex here? Alex? He's, uh, he's got class right now. Oh, does he? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Good morning, everybody. We are the ContraTech Group. My name is Joseph Bilstrom. I'm Matthew Wilson. I'm Brandon Meyer. And I'm Mike Schmidt. For our agenda today, I will be going over the project overview with you. Um, Matthew will be going over the Primo RP6 files. Brandon will be, oh, Joe will be going over the technology and the demonstration of our project. And Brandon will be going over the challenges and the uh, postmortem. And we'll end with some questions. So for our project overview, we are working with ContraTech. ContraTech is a startup group out of Australia that deals with project planning for the construction and the uh, construction and transportation industries. So what their problem was is that the actual files, the project planning files, are very elaborate and very expensive. So what they would like us to do is, or their, their solution was that uh, they would like a web app to simplify uh, viewing these files because they are much too expensive and they didn't actually need all the bells and whistles within the software itself. And so, they created the Project Planner application. The Project Planner application was actually created by a previous capstone group. They, they added the functionality of adding Microsoft project files and uh, being able to view these files as Gantt charts on their application. What we have been asked to do is actually go and add the functionality of importing the uh, Primavera P6 files as well as adding visualization for the milestones. So some of the actual adaptations we've had to make to the original request is that we learned through our research that the, that the uh, files for the Microsoft product file and the Premiere RP6 are both proprietary files. That means that we're not legally allowed to actually go and attempt to export them. So we were initially asked to edit and be able to export back to the original file format for both the Microsoft product files and the Premiere files. But we found that because it, we can no longer do the export, that the editing as well was obsolete. So this here is a screenshot of the actual project planner application. As you can see here, this is actually the uh, file for a Primavera file. You can see that by the .xer file form uh, extension. And then here you can also see that we have the milestones shown as black diamonds, the start and the finish milestone. So moving on to our schedule, for Sprint 1, we had to do a lot of documentation and research. The documentation, need, or documentation showed that there's a lot of, there's opportunity to enhance it, and so we decided to go and actually overhaul a lot of the diagrams to better portray what they're trying to uh, show with the diagram and how the, the, how the uh, application actually works. For Sprint 2, oh, sorry, also for Sprint 1, we had uh, overhaul for the set of documentation. This is so that anyone that has to actually work with the project planner in the future can easily set up their own local environment so they can test and debug the application much easier. Sprint 2, we were able to actually go out and parse the entire Primavera file out. Sprint 3, we were able to go and actually import the entire Primavera file into our application. And for Sprint 4, we worked on the visualization for those milestones, shown as the black diamonds in the previous slide, as well as working on uh, previously existing bugs. For our team management, we decided to use Trello for our task logging because it's a very easy to use uh, UI and it was very easy for us to see what needed to be done and what needed to get done by a certain times. We used GitLab as our code repository because that was provided for us by ContraTech. We used Discord as our informal communication base for everyone because everyone was very uh, versed in Discord. And finally we have Skype for Business was our formal weekly meet, uh, meetings with our sponsor because it is a platform built for professionalism. Now I'm going to actually hand it off to Matthew now who's going to talk a bit more about the Premium RP6 files. Alright, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of the file that we were working with and how we kind of use that to get the information out of it and put it into the planner application in a similar vein as the Microsoft file. So first, Primavera um, just in and of itself is another project planning application. It's not much different from the Microsoft project planner and a lot of the information that we got was pretty similar in that way. So it made it really easy to 
adapt that stuff together and really make it a really smooth transition between the two different files. So half of the Primavera um, is in a spreadsheet format, which really gives a lot of clean information on start dates, end dates, all that kind of stuff. The other half of it is formatted in a Gantt chart, and that's a lot of what a lot of the um, sponsors' uh, employees have been used to. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a visualization that kind of mirrored that a little bit so they would be familiar with it. So the Primavera also deals a lot with the scheduling, the editing of different um, project plans depending on how much time has been spent or if something's ahead or behind to schedule. So there's a lot of changing in the Primavera too. That is something that the sponsor really wants to get into this planner application for the future. And Primavera likes to have two similar but different uh, types of tasks. The first being a general task that takes a certain amount of time, has a start date and end date, and a milestone which generally marks the beginning or the end of a group of tasks or some major task in the project. And finally, uh, the completions and delays which are very important when you're modifying a schedule for a plan or something like that. So this is a little bit of what the project planner in Primavera looks like. You can see this is the spreadsheet format and it is very simple. You can see the grouping in it and the start and end dates, the description, all that kind of stuff is there. It's really simple to read and use and that makes it really nice for our sponsor's business. And here you can see the visualization. So you can see a little bit how we tried to mirror that visualization with the diamonds for milestones. Is that something that is already implemented in Primavera? So we wanted to make sure the transition was nice. And you can see here how clean it is and how much information is put on there. So the file in and of itself has a really structured way of representing information. Some of it you can read through plain text through just opening the file, reading through it, but there's some that is encoded in a way that makes it really hard um, to either understand or to work through to get um, just if you have the plain file by itself. There's also a lot of data that gets pushed off to the side. It tries to work in this chart format, but the spacing isn't even across all the columns, and so a lot of the information gets pushed and pulled together in different locations, and it becomes really hard to read around the central area when you put a lot of information into one area. And there is a nice tasks and milestones section. Um, there's a lot of information that goes into that, including changes that are made to the task and how it's changing, getting ahead or behind schedules, stuff like that. So there's a lot of information in there and it took us a lot of time to dig through that and pick out the stuff that we really needed to understand and see inside the project planner. So you can see a little bit of the file here. This is one of the earlier sections and it's a little bit nicer as far as parts of the file go. You can see a little bit of the encoded data in there with just a bunch of symbols that you can't really understand or interpret um, when it's in plain text like this. And you can also see how the columns start to get pushed to the side as a lot of information gets put in there that outdoes the spacing that is already given to it. So it gets really confusing really easily. So that's why we took the time to parse through that so we could really get a better understanding of what the file was doing and what we were actually dealing with. So you can see a little bit of the parsed file here. There's a lot of uh, information put in here. You can see how it represents the tables and rows there on the left side. The task IDs, there's a bunch of reference IDs to other parts of the project that you have to look through and really understand how things are connecting. Um, calendars, projects, all that stuff kind of combines in this section to really determine where things are going. And also at the end here, the percent complete, that usually determines if a task is currently in progress, if it's done, if it hasn't started. It's just a lot of stuff going on here um, and a lot of information that we were trying to work with. So this is a little bit more important for our uh, tasks in the project planner application. So you can see the tags there on the left hand side of um, either a task or a milestone and that really determines for us what kind of visualization we're going to give to it, as well as um, some of the dates. We'll give that away if they're more or less than um, one day or something like that, where 
a task will have a long stretch of time where it's being worked on, whereas a milestone won't. It'll just be one day. And so we can pick that out and really use that to determine if we're going to display it as a bar or as just a symbol um, as the black diamond in the visualization. And you can see a couple of the other tags that go into there if project or if a task has been completed or if it's still being worked on or if it hasn't even been started yet. So all that information gets rolled in up here. So I'll let Joe show you a little bit of what the planner application looks like. All right, hello everybody, I'm Joe and I'm gonna be going over the technologies we use to actually develop this product as well as a bit of a video demonstration to show how the product actually works. So this project consists of three core components I would say. The first one being our database, which we have using PostgreSQL a pretty popular open source database service. And that is then being hosted on Amazon Web Services. That will then connect back through our RESTful API written in Java 8. Uh, we did try Java 9 for a while and that didn't play nice, so we actually ended up rolling back to a more uh, workable version. And so this is written in a pretty popular API framework known as Spring Boot. And that whole interface has been set up to, yeah, connect with the database, take in all of our parsing information, handle that kind of processing that Matthew was working on in the actual code implementation, and eventually insert that into the database. Lastly then, from the user experience end, we have our front end, which is a web app written in JavaScript, specifically in React, which is a very popular JavaScript framework made by Facebook. And the idea being that can interface with our API, which can query the database, which can then retrieve all of our newly parsed information. So we have a little video here to demonstrate this, which I'll just start this off. So upon first starting the program, you're presented with a simple login, which we're just gonna go ahead and do that right now. Upon logging in, this is your main workspace area. We have functionality for logging out in the top right. <clears throat> and then over there in the middle, we have that upload button, which allows you to upload both file types. We're actually gonna start off uploading a Microsoft file, which you can see by that .mpp file extension, and we'll see that that made it in just fine. And now we're gonna go ahead and add an additional .xer file extension, which corresponds to the Primavera files, which is what we wanted to be adding in. So both of those have made it in, and what I'm actually gonna go do is go into the Microsoft one first. So here's just an example of the Gantt chart. We have our full parent level task up top with all related subtasks below. You have the option to toggle tasks if you want a bit more of a clean presentation. You can also print it out on a physical page. And then that diamond right there is the milestone support that we work to add in. Now we're gonna go back out into the uh, Primavera file, and I'm actually gonna pause the video here real quick. So you notice that it really does look identical in this design, that's kind of the idea of this whole project, was that you would be able to import uh, project planning types of different file formats, being Microsoft, Primavera, or really anything else that you could find the support for. And the idea being the program would take that information, strip out all the generic and same information, and just present it as this Gantt chart. So essentially, at this state in the program, um, it doesn't really care what file format it is because they've all been made to be identical data types. And so I'm just gonna continue it on. So these tasks are actually all related to each other, which means if you click the top bar, you can actually collapse them down together. And that you'll see we do have two milestones on the side there, toggling support still works and all that stuff. This sidebar here actually does allow you to navigate in between different project files without having to go all the way back up to the parent page. So you can just click a different one from that sidebar and if you'll see the background just change, you can just jump right over to a different task. Just makes it a little bit easier, a little bit nicer for the user experience. And you can go back up to the top level. All files do have support to be deleted, which we're just demonstrating right now. And those will clear themselves out of the database permanently. And then lastly, we just log out. And that's about it. All right. And so now I'm going to move on to Brandon, who's going to go over our challenges and the post-mortem process. All right. So starting out, we first initially, when we got the project, we had to get the database set up. We didn't get the credentials from our mentor for a while, so we had to kind of wait on that. And then to set up the database, we had to get a external program called Docker. Docker handles all the automation for us on setting the database up and connecting to it and whatnot. And Docker has a couple of requirements, like you need virtualization enabled, and if you don't, you would have to go into the system BIOS to even change that. And for a couple of us, Docker didn't play nice. Me in particular, I had to get a different version of Docker, not a ver version, but a different application 
of Docker just because it wasn't supported on my computer. And then another challenge we had to work around is our mentor is in Australia. They're in a completely different time zone, so for us it's Tuesday, for him it's Wednesday. Our meetings we held at 3 or 8 o'clock at Thursday night, which would be his Friday at 1. And when we first initially got the project, there were pre-existing bugs that we didn't know about until we got to Sprint 4 when we started diving into the front end. The first bug I'll talk about is some of the information would be displayed in a reversed order. This bug rarely happened, so it wasn't a big issue. We did fix it, and the fix we did was just to simple reload the page. The next bug that we spent a good majority of Sprint 4 working on is the print preview bug. And what this bug is, is when you would go to print a page and it would display the preview, the gap chart would be cut off unless you change the window size to be half of the screen. This is because they designed the view of the chart by taking the window width and not the page width. And so unless we were to completely go in and rechange how the Gantt chart is displayed, we couldn't fix this bug. The next bug is the Primavera timestamp bug. And what was happening is some tasks were given a start date of the beginning of Unix time. And in this image here, you can see that black line there. It's a bunch of dates all stacked on top of each other because it's going all the way back to Unix start time. We did fix this, and now it's all nice and pretty as you saw in the demonstration. So kind of our post-mortem. This project was very diverse in that we had all these a database, we had this API to look into, and then we had JavaScript in the front end. So it made it a little more difficult, but at the same time, it presented us with an opportunity to, to, opportunity to learn more because now we have all these different eras, areas to learn from, and they were all using languages that are kind of very popular and relevant right now. Some of the stretch goals that we weren't able to get around to that they wanted is showing tasks ahead and behind schedule. So basically, we would take today's date and then we would look at the task to see, okay, how much percent done is this task? And if so, is it ahead or behind schedule? Next, they also want to be able to edit the charts by clicking on things and dragging them around. So if they want to take, say, a task in group one and move it to group two, they could just click, drag, boom, done. And then since the Microsoft file and Xer files were proprietary files and we couldn't actually edit them, they instead wanted a log that would be kind of printed out and showing what edits had been, had been made during the session so then they could give it to someone to go into actual Primavera program and make the edits there. Any questions? Couple, couple quick ones. Uh, one is a real trivia. Uh, <coughs> you just say delete and it deletes. You might yeah. want to come back and say, do you really want to delete? It's Not a bad a idea. <laughs> trivia. Um, the, the other was related more to the, uh, you, you have percent complete, and either it probably should show in the to do next time or I thought at one time they wanted to have like a, a cast bar colored differently for how the percent complete. Is, is that still on a wish list or did they change their minds? That ended up getting kind of redesigned into being the showing tasks ahead and behind schedule, which is something that Primavera natively does. Um, so basically that would be represented rather than being a bar going under the line, it's actually a vertical line that is either ahead of the task or ahead the task if it's oh. ahead schedule or behind the task. Okay, I didn't notice but, that. Either. Yeah. We didn't end up getting that. That was a stretch goal that didn't make it in. We had some feedback from the mentor already, and he's happy. Oh, that's good to hear. <laughs> I like that. Were you able to uh, decode all of the tasks that were in those files, or were there certain things that you couldn't represent? 
Yeah, the the task section is actually really nice where there's only one section that's actually encoded like that. Um, and it seems to be some sort of ID um, of some sort that we really couldn't pick out. So a lot of the task data is there. And because there was no, we ended up not having to export. It really wasn't necessary to pick that out since we had the start date, end dates, and all the other stuff in there. So that part ended up being really nice. There's just a lot of other stuff in the file that ends up being something that we lose because there's enco encoding like that. So. And then are you able to um, represent the dependencies between tasks? I didn't see that. Uh, you mean how they're grouped together? or? Well, you know, you have one, one task that's dependent on another task completing it. Oh, sure. there's a little arrow that connects them. Right. We didn't get to the arrow. However, tasks are grouped together if they're associated. In the sake of the examples we use in this presentation, they're you know they're pretty small. Um, we did have much larger files to work with that were pages long, but they were um, confident and confidential information provided by our mentor, and they requested that we don't show those in presentations. Uh, so yes and no. We didn't get to the arrows, but we do have groupings that shows how tasks depend on one another. And my last question is, how do you how do you set up users? You basically just cl click the create account button and it sets up a full um, authentication process through uh, the API. I guess I have one question. So this is primarily for viewing. You can't edit anything in the Gantt chart. Like, oh, a task has gone too long, or oh, the, we have completed this task. That has to be re-uploaded every time. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. It was initially uh, requested that you could make edits like that. Um, but then once we found out that ac exporting the file um, is not legally allowed, it sort of made the editing thing like, we could have still added it, but it wouldn't have really served its full purpose in that sense, because you, you can edit it, but then you can't take it out of the page, essentially. Um, but it was an initial request that the, it ended up getting scrapped because of all that. Yeah, and the changelog is kind of a compromise between actually editing it and being able to export it, so. Yes. All of it, which was the most challenging thing you ran across that was the hardest to figure out and the hardest to overcome that you actually did overcome? I know some of them you said you couldn't because of proprietary things. I and feel stuff. we all have a different experience. Yeah, right? yeah. Why well, just go down the line? Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll make you go first. That's cool. <laughs> um, so, <coughs> my biggest thing was probably figuring out the bug for having to come in backwards for some reason. I um, So, it was coming in backwards as in that all the tasks that, so you have the title here and then you have the, all the tasks as its children, it would come in flipped. And so, um, for some reason, that happened you know, once every 100 times. So it wasn't so much as very tough to fix, but it was very tough to replicate. So it was tough to actually check if my fixes worked, things like that. Yeah, I think mine was just dealing with the file. There was a lot of stuff inside of it. Getting to parse out really nicely was really difficult and took a lot of time for us to get to that. So I'd say that's mine. Um, personally, I'd go with the front end, the React portion of things. Uh, I, I really like Angular. I'm very comfortable with Angular. And so having to shift to a different framework with a, a, a different enough syntax where there was a bit of that cognitive dissonance where it's like, I, I know how to do this in a different way, but I can't figure out how to do it in this way. Um, so figure, figuring out that, those very subtle differences in how it's actually written. For me, it was figuring out the print screen bug because I was new to React and whatnot, so it was difficult kind of figuring out how exactly the Gantt chart was being displayed. And I had to do a lot of digging to eventually figure out where this with variable was and how they were getting it set and whatnot. So I'm new to all this. Do you guys get to, this is just something when you sign up for a capstone project, you say you're gonna do this for this company and you own nothing, you created something and that's just, you give it back to them. Is that, that's kind of the agreement? Correct. I mean, in a sense, yes. So, what well, we were actually given already a kind of a template because this was originally created by another capstone group. So, things like the authentication, things we never actually had to deal with, but we, in a sense, they said, all right, so here's what we would like out of this. Please go do this. And so, that's when we had to go and spend a lot of time researching and figuring out how to deal with these technologies that most of us haven't actually heard of. Yeah, I think in its, in its own right, um, maybe back on the challenges kind of question, uh, I'm not sure how many other capstone groups did have a, basically they were given a previously existing product to work on. A lot of them had the freedom of choice to design it from the ground up themselves in a language they were comfortable with, in something they knew. In our case, we were handed something that was you know, three fourths done, but fully designed by different people with different backgrounds, different education, 
And so you're essentially trying to read someone else's work, um, which in our case, the, the documentation was a little threadbare, which made that more challenging. But yeah, it's like in its, in its own right, it kind of let us figure out quite a lot of things. Like I, I think everything that was in this project, we have never learned in school. So we really, we really did learn all of it, um, at least language-wise, you know, from the ground up, which was, you know, a little challenging, but I think it an overall good experience. Yeah, I mean, really, that's the goal of a capstone, <coughs> get you ready for industry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think this project did a good job about not just having us learn these new technologies and things, but also having us read other people's code and really understand it so that way we can add to it and make it better. I gained a lot of appreciation for writing documentation that's, like, good. <laughs> I mean, the reality is that's the way the world is. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's a good experience. Not every, not every software engineer out of school gets to create something from the ground up. Great. Thank you.